Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of the Sports Insight with your host Alamdar Khan. And yes, we're always here to provide you information about sports from all across the globe. Not to forget, you surely can reach out to us on our social media handle which is at the rate of Indus News Sports. That basically works both for Instagram and Twitter. But anyways, we'll go to the headlines first. Yes, from the world of cricket, seven additional cricket are invited to join the national camp of Pakistan ODIs, which actually is the T20 squad that was recently announced for the tours of South Africa and Zimbabwe. And yes, India beats England by eight runs in the fourth T20 international. Now they've tied 2-2. And yes, from Football Championship, Birmingham City won against Reading FC by 2-1 on Wednesday. And yes, from the world of golf, Matt Jones hold a three-shot lead at the Honda Classics on Thursday. And yes, from the world of NBA, Washington Wizards defeated Utah Jazz by 131. 122 on Thursday. And yes, those were the headlines with regards to the world of sports. To, to begin with, we surely would, would discuss cricket. And yes, there's a lot of happening. There's a lot of news. There are a lot of updates with regards to not only Pakistani cricket, but obviously cricket from all across the globe. And to discuss cricket, we have Ali Mehdi, a cricket expert with us. Ali, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. So anyways, we'll start with the first things first. Uh, uh, we are ready for the Proteas. We surely have to be ready for the Proteas going for that tour. Not only that, we also are preparing ourselves for the uh, match against Zimbabwe. So let's talk about the seven additional cricketers to begin with who have actually joined the camp, the national camp, which is going to be uh, more interesting. Why? Because they're big names. I mean, like we've seen Shah Nawaz Dhani. Uh, a new entry who has actually made a phenomenal bowling with, with regards to his performance in PSN. Not only that, like Zahid Mahmood, the Naseem Shah. So, what's your take on the newly seven enrolled people for the camp? Oh, I think it's a very good inclusion. It adds more depth to the squad. It's added more flavor to it. I mean, look, you know, you need to go a big squad. You're talking about a biosecure bubble over here. They're going to be playing three T20s and then obviously some ODIs. Uh, in both uh, uh, South Africa and Zimbabwe. So I think it was needed. You know, you need to have versatility over here. And, you know, the seven players, you know, like you mentioned, Dhani is over there too. Uh, Sa uh, also, Naseem Shah will be there too. You know, they've got that extra zip, extra firepower. And there's going to be st strong competition amongst ranks for, you know, for these spots too. So I think it was very important that you get all these players in get them to uh, play amongst each other, get them to be in a biosecure bubble over here, and then so that you can prepare them so that when they go to South Africa, they're well, you know, they're well oiled, they're well, um, they're well skilled and they'll be able to fire and also the intervention once they reach South Africa and uh, Zimbabwe. Right. Uh, let's talk about, let's start with, uh, I'll focus more on because I remember watching this superb performance by Dhani. Uh, how do you see him as a bowler? And you know, he, it was his debutant with regards to PSL, but his performance as a bowler was literally, literally phenomenal. I think a little bit of energy, a little bit of uh, charisma added to, a little bit of practice added to this young kid, this young lad. I think he can surely uh, give brilliant numbers for Pakistan cricket team. No, the best thing about Dhani is that he's been actually doing okay. He's been doing very well in the Kaiti Azam Trophy. Right. It's only more recently that he's actually been performing well in the white ball format. In the white ball format, he had a very good PSL. He played a couple of very good games. I mean, he's the one who actually, every year with the PSL, uh, what we see is that there are one or two young players which actually emerge. You talk about Shadab in 2016. You talk about Fakhar Zaman also emerged from that. Hasnain in 2019 came. And then there, there's some more players. And then last year it was Heather Ali and Abdullah Shafiq too. And now you have Dhani this year. So, I mean, this, this is the best thing about the PSL because you have this conveyor belt of talent. The best thing about him is that he's got raw pace, he's got good skill, and he's somebody if you know if he's well oiled, if he's given uh, this, if you let him go, but you know with the flow, then I think he is, he should be a great addition to this. As well. Right. You just mentioned one amazing cricketer, which obviously Heather Ali. If you look back into his performance with regards to PSL, 
I agree because it's going to take him some while to get there. But him coordinating with the senior and you know being there, being straight on the bat when it comes to straight drives, whenever when he's like totally focused on the ball. And yes, for him, I think it was also a phenomenal PS, PSL performance. No, I think the, the best discovery we've had since last year. You see, the thing with Heather Ali is that Heather Ali was not initially selected into the squad because of his PSL, but because of the Under-19 World Cup where he helped Pakistan against uh, make it to the semi-finals in 2020. I mean, right. he played very well and he was our best player. It was then actually that he continued that uh, streak in the PSL too, and he's done very well in the local T20 and uh, 50 over championships too in, in Pakistan. So he, he continued that form. And then once he was selected in his debut against England a couple of months ago, he's continued with that very strong form. The best thing about him is that he can play with, uh, amongst the 360 degree arc. He can hit the ball very hard. But amongst the, the best thing about him is that he's for a young 19, 20 year old, he's very mature, he's uh, uh, integrated very well into the sport and he gets along very well with the seniors. So he's one we really need to nurture and need to take care of because we have two World Cups, one in India and then right. we've got Australia next year. So he's one for the future. Right. And let's talk about one thing that, you know, Pakistan mostly lacks is, is starting or the top order batsmen. I think one of the major discoveries, obviously Heather Lee is definitely one of the major discoveries, but when we talk about Mohammad Rizwan, you know, Mohammad Rizwan has actually shown that charisma, the consistency of his performance, not only as an amazing wicketkeeper, but also as an amazing batsman, you know. He's finally come up to prove himself as, you know, being consistent. That is one thing that, you know, Pakistan cricket team was lacking, the top order batsman. How do you see that impacting our national team? You see, the thing with Mohammad Rizwan is that he's the most improved cricketer in the past one or two years. He's been phenomenal in all formats. You talk about Test Series, you could talk about T20s and also on Odia, he's been very good. The thing is with him, with Mohammad Rizwan is that, you know, he's not intimidated. He loves, he thrives upon challenges. You talk about the series in New Zealand right now. He was our best player over there behind the stumps too and he played very well, as you know, back, batting wise too. Right now in the PSL, he was the best batsman. In fact, I think he was the highest run getter too, Kumul Tan Sultan. He was leading from the front. At the same time, he's so safe behind the, uh, uh, behind the gloves. In the series we had against England last year, he was, you know, he actually took all catches. So he's our most improved cricketer. We talk about tests, but in T20s, right. um, he's been very good behind the stumps. He's very calm and composed. And the best thing about him is that he cemented his spot for that World T20, which we're going to play later this year. Right. Talking about T20s, I remember a statement from him saying that, you know, he's pretty much solid when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, the test cricket as well. And after that, he managed to prove his worth as well. So I think overall forte or overall team balance that has actually come out with PCB deciding all of the situation, all of the teams for, that have actually have to go to Zimbabwe and have to go to meet the Proteas are pretty much spot on. But let's talk about the situation scenario of the COVID taking over the entire picture, like how PSL came to a halt, which was definitely a major upset or a major blow for not only us cricket watchers or all the enthusiasts, but also for the players, for, for PCB, for, for the government itself. How do you see that, you know, when they, when they want to continue? Because that's one news that have, that have come out that, you know, they want to do or have the event again in June. But how do you see us this time managing that biosecure bubble because COVID wave is growing further and further ahead. Well, that's a very good question. You see, with, when it comes to the uh, PSL, it was a, a very abrupt ending happened. It was very unfortunate the way it ended. I mean, everybody was really getting, we were getting into the thick of things right now. We were getting into the second stage that unfortunately it was halted. But I think it was because of inconsistencies in management and because the biosecure bubble was breached. But going into uh, the next window, which they propose, which will be in June, right. it, I believe it's going to be taking place in Karachi, and right. it's going to be basically it's going to the ECB has decided to uh, outsource it to a bio, uh, outsource it to a UK-based company, the biosecurity bubble is going to be. So wow. there's going to be strict me measures to that. All the players are going to have to follow, you know, international guidelines when it regards to a biosecurity bubble, and then at the same time, you know, you, you, and they're going to be very strict measures. But above all. I think that, you know, once they don't want to make the same mistakes again, the PCB, and if I was the PCB, I hope the PSB what they do is that they, they don't take this non-seriously, they take it seriously, right. and if required, don't allow fans to come inside the stadium, don't allow anybody to come within that bubble uh, until, you know, this uh, COVID is fully eradicated or just fully vaccinated, I think. 
Right. But if you look at the entire situation of the COVID situation, uh, PSN obviously had multiple teams. They need, they had to secure them in one hotel. They had to secure them in one area because obviously yeah. there are multiple layers. Multiple. Yes, it is tough. It is tough to a point that if we look into how India would probably look into the T20 World Cup, do you see that happening? Because I've spoken to a few Indian journalists as well, and we've discussed this scenario that you know, it would be a big or maybe the biggest challenge to host the T20 World Cup and if something goes wrong, if one player gets hold of it, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a huge disaster. That's why I think that right now, if you're talking about India, mm -hmm. they have the IPL which will be beginning in a couple of weeks time. That's going to be the real litmus test. How is the, in the BCCI going to handle the IPL over there? I believe there are only three or four cities where they're actually hosting the uh, the uh, Indian Premier League for 2021. Right. If that goes through, I think they're going, to sh they're going to use that same model for the 2021 uh, ICC T20 World Cup in, in India. So India has a huge challenge too because their COVID cases are rising too and exponentially Absolutely. too. So if they can if they can actually pass through that litmus test with flying colours, then I think they'll use that same uh, model uh, for the World Cup too. But I think it's going to be very challenging time for India too and it really depends how they uh, how the IPL goes. Well, uh, absolutely. It's more like the preliminaries for them because as you mentioned, you know, uh, they have the IPL coming. If they pass this IPL test with flying colors, they'll surely be ready for the in, in international ICC T20 World Cup. Let's hope that happens and talking about India, let's focus on the England versus India series that's happening. It's been an interesting journey from the tests to up till now. Obviously, England and India are basically thriving for that first place because England is still on top, India is on the second. A last match, what happened was in India managed to win. And before that, obviously, England managed to win. So, and we, we, there's only one match left. So, it's tied right now in terms of the T20. Where do you see the situation going after the last match that's going to happen? Uh, because it's going to be interesting. It's in the biggest, in the largest stadium of India. It's a new pitch. It's a new situation. And both the team are actually struggling to get there to that number one seed. Well, you know, it's, it's set up a mouth-watering clash the fifth and final T20, which will be played, taking place on Saturday. But if you look at the match yesterday, it ended a streak of three, three matches where the bad team uh, winning the toss decided to bowl first and actually chase down the score. So that completely changed yesterday when India actually set up a massive score of about 185 and managed to defend it. At one time, it did look like India were going to, uh, England were going to chase it down. But once, you know, the bowlers like uh, Shardul Thakur came and you know, held his composure, he managed to just about bowl very well that last over and managed to hold uh, England at bay. But what it's done is that it's set up a, a mouth-watering tie for the final 5 and T20. And I think both teams are at par right now. Whoever actually takes the 5th T20 will have a good chance of actually taking that uh, number one spot for the time being. Right. Talking about precedent, P PSL also had that precedent that, you know, everybody who managed to chase was the team who actually could chase and win. The last match that happened obviously came up to a point of breaking that precedent. Let's hope the last match that happens between India and England uh, becomes that enthusiastic match because obviously both of them, both of the teams are in the full victory and the full thought process of winning it. What would be your prediction? Because uh, when it comes to the test side, we've seen a major disappointment on the England side. But yes, we've seen phenomenal side when it comes to Team India. But how do you see the final T20 that's going to be the final T20 which would be deciding their fate? Well, it's going to be very even, uh, the final T20 between England and India. I mean, it's just been such a seesaw sort of a series. One match England wins, then India won, England, then England won again, then India won. So it's going to be very tough. And now that the streak is broken, right. I think that will give confidence to the team batting first. But if you were to ask me, I think still think that India have the upper hand. They're playing at home. You know, their players are firing on all cylinders. Virat Kohli has been in sensational form. Right. He had a bad game in the last one. But at the same time, you have so much talent. Rohit Sharma is back. Yadav played a, uh, hit a magnificent 57 of 31 balls yesterday. Right. Hunt played well. Uh, Sharia Spire got 37. And at the same time, you know, the bowlers have actually bowled well. So, right. um, I would say that let's, India would just edge it because they're, because they're playing at home. Let's hope for the best, Ali. With regards to, I'm sure that, you know, your wisdom would surely add more to the show. Thank you very much for being a part of our show. And we'll definitely catch up with you again. So, pleasure. So that was the end. Obviously, he added the same thing 
India is stressed slightly on the edge of the Victoria side because of the home ground edge. But anyways, let's see what happens in the final T20. Till then, take a break and I'll see you guys after the break. And yes, welcome back from the break. And yes, before the break, we were discussing the world of cricket and all the happenings with regards to not only Pakistan cricket team, but also the situation with India and England. But anyways, we'll quickly start, switch over to the next segment, which is football championship. Yes, we'll talk about Champion League standings, the championship standings to be precise. And you know, to discuss all of this, interesting upgrades and updates. Uh, we, we have with us Gabriel Sutton all the way from UK. Gabriel, thank you for being on the show. Oh, that's my pleasure, Saeed. Thanks for having me. Great. So, we'll start off with, obviously, the last match that happened. Birmingham City won against Reading FC by 2-0. What is your take on that? And, you know, we can go into the in-depth, but what is your take on that? How do you see that victory? Because it's their fourth victory in the last 20 games. Yeah, it's a 2-1 victory. Um, really important result for, for Birmingham City in Lee Bowyer's first game in charge. He's made a, a real impact at Blues, just in terms of the energy around the club. Fans weren't allowed in at St Andrews, of course, because uh, because of the health climate. Uh, but, um, but, but it was almost, I think, that first 20 minutes when that intensity from Blues was so strong and the way they pressed. It was as if fans were in the ground uh, in some respects. So, really big impact. I just think Lee Bowyer, because he was part of the League Cup winning side in 2011 as a player, since he's returned to the club, he's a really popular figure. And I think he's someone whose who's honesty and passion is getting everyone on side. A little bit of a contrast to his predecessor. So, the result leaves Birmingham six points above the, the drop zone, albeit Rotherham have a few games in hand. Uh, but some great performances out there and uh, I think it is a victory. Yeah, so let's talk about obviously uh, Lukas Djokovic to begin with, uh, how it managed to put the team ahead obviously to begin with and then we can talk more about the versatility and obviously as you mentioned Lee Boyer's entry in the club making that change. So we'll talk about your take on uh, Lukas Djokovic. Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of Lukas Djokovic. I think he's always been a, a, he's a, he's a big target man. He's always been better when you've played him alongside a striker. We had a great partnership with Che Atoms a couple of seasons ago, he's since gone to Southampton. Um, had a good partnership with Scott Hogan last season, and that's been sort of rekindled by Lee Bowyer. And um, I think for this season, you know, th that trademark header at the back post had kind of gone out of his game a little bit so it's great to see that that's something that Bowie has brought back into his game on this this early evidence it was a great cross from Jeremy Bear who's a, a right-footed player playing on the left sort of curled it in and Djokovic yeah he dominated Liam Moore in the air and got really what you'd have to describe as a trademark Lucas Djokovic finish so it's great that he's back and there's signs of that partnership with uh, Scott Hogan working pretty well. Yeah, S sounds promising. And not only that, I would surely want to hear more about Lee Boyers joining them as well. Because before that, you know, we've, we've noticed a lot of um, coaches switching, trading, coming, going, you know, but it automatically changes the entire perspective of the game. Why is it that, you know, this plays an importer on a very integral part in, in the team itself? Yeah, I, I think Blues have changed more managers than than would have would have liked. Uh, I think in lots of respects because um, since Gary Rowett left, um, there's been uh, the, a lot of money invested in possibly the wrong managers, right. and maybe in some cases managers haven't had enough time or things haven't worked out for various reasons. Um, but I think in Lee Bowyer, Blues have got someone who can motivate the players, who can get the fans on side. Um, and, um, you know, is, is Bowie going to take Blues forward long term? I don't know, because there's a lot of issues, I think, at boardroom level in terms of transparency, in terms of recruitment. And I think those are issues that we're going to have to work at further down the line. But I think so far, great start for Lee Bowie, and I think a lot of fans are right behind him. True. I think it's more like a backbone of any club. I think that is how it actually works for them. But anyways, we'll look into the standings of the clubs right now. And we surely want your wisdom with regards to... We'll start with obviously the top four. Let's talk about Norwich City. And they've been winning the last... It's like a straightforward streak for them. How do you see them even taking it further? And then we'll talk about Watford. 
Yeah, uh, I, I think Norwich will get will win the title like they did two seasons ago. Um, what's interesting, we've talked about sort of manage, managerial changes, and I think where you've got to give Norwich credit is they've stuck with Daniel Farker. He had a bit of an indifferent first season in charge in 17-18 when they finished in mid-table, the football wasn't quite coming as they would have hoped. Uh, second season, they won the title under Farker, but in the Premier League, they finished bottom of the league. They stuck by their manager, wow. and now they're reaping the rewards. So a club that's produced a lot, of, a, a lot of young players, partly from their, you know, from their academy. You're looking at Max Aarons, a right back who's got a massive future. I think he can become uh, a world class player. Um, they've got Ollie Skip on loan from Tottenham Hotspur. I think he's another player I would expect to see in the Champions League um, at some point. And they've also been able to find um, gems from abroad, like uh, Emmy Buendia, who they signed in 2018. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Buendia went somewhere like Atletico Madrid. He's a really uh, exciting footballer. Um, what's interesting, actually, is that Norwich don't have a great championship record without Emmy Buendia. They had uh, a spell a couple of months ago when Buendia was out of the side uh, due to suspension and they struggled to score goals. So that was a massive win at Nottingham Forest on Wednesday to actually get that victory, scored two early goals and without their key Argentine. You uh, actually just mentioned that you know you're looking at Norwich City to uh, continue with the with this with this victory with the streak that they're going, and you're looking forward on their victory as well. Uh, Watford has been doing well. Besides, I guess the last match. How do you see? Would that be possible? Is there a possibility of them to chase uh, Norwich City for now? Well, um, I, th I think firstly that um, I think Watford will have their eyes on finishing in the automatic promotion spot. So the top two go up automatically right. in the championship. So if Watford finish second, regardless of whether or not they they catch Norwich, that's a good achievement. I think what you've got to say with Norwich is with Watford is that there's just been a massive turnaround in their performance levels since they moved from a 4-4-2 that Zisco Munez, their manager, initially had to the 4-3-3. It's given a lot more freedom to the likes of Ismail Assar and Ken Semmer as wide forwards to actually link up and, and combine in, in tight spaces rather than be the ones providing the width. And actually, we've seen the fullbacks, um, Kike Femenia and Adam Massina, they've been the ones providing the width for Watford. And I think that's been massive. Likewise, the return of Will Hughes, who's a really talented technical player. I wouldn't be surprised if he still can uh, maybe even salvage a career for England. I think his passing is that good. Um, Zinka Nagel's come in and done well in midfield too. So, yeah, Watford are looking like a really complete side at the moment. And I think that was shown in their 4-1 victory at Rotherham on Tuesday night. So you think, uh, OK, so basically what you're saying, the top two obviously will make sure. So Watford basically try to sustain that. Will Swansea be able to catch up with them? I don't think so, Say no. Um, I think in terms of the points, it looks like Swansea are quite close challenges to Watford. They're only three points behind with a game in hand. So on paper, right. you would have to say that Swansea have um, <clears throat> excuse me, a chance of catching Watford. Right. I don't think their performance levels are sustainable in terms of an automatic promotion race. They right. lost 3-0 at Bournemouth on Tuesday, but if you look at them in victories at Luton on the previous Saturday, um, very fortunate in that one. I think a couple of their other victories against Middlesbrough and, Swans and, uh, and Stoke, it was all very much down to disputed penalty decisions. So on another day, they quite e could quite easily have drawn so, those. So Gabriel, so we currently we currently focus on uh, the top two that you've, we've discussed. We've talked about. I think we look forward on the top two remaining. The top two. Thank you so very much, Gabriel Sutton, for being a part of the show. Uh, we'll surely be calling you again and again. Pleasure. No pleasure. problem. Thank you. All the best. So that was Gabriel Sutton with his insights with regards to the championship. And not only that, we'll, we'll jump over to the next news of the day about the world of golf. Yes, Matt Jones, who actually manages to hold a three-shot lead at the Honda Classics on Thursday. And that is the interesting thing. Not only that, Jones carded bogey-free 61 to equal Brian Harmon on the course. I mean, not to forget that this was the last record by Brian Harmon on the PGA National. Not only that, Lee, Lee Westwood actually birdied uh, his final two holes at the salvage level of par. Minus 70. Anyways, that is how things are. Lee Westwood obviously has his own level of playing, but at this time, I think Matt Jones 
still has that edge on the whole situation. Let's see how things develop further in the world of golf and the Honda Classics. Let's fo follow that. But anyways, that was from the world of golf. I'll quickly jump over to the world of NBA. Not to forget, I'm going to be talking about Utah Jazz. Yes, they've obviously they're like the top-notch team for now. But Washington Wizards managed to defeat them 131-122. But definitely, they're still leading the NBA charts with the NBA team ranking. But obviously, if you're on the top and you have that loss, it surely is a big, big upset. But anyways, they will be now. The Wizards are, will be facing. Brooklyn Nets would surely be interesting if they're ready for James Harden, Kyrie Irving, if he's playing, that is because of his injury on the hamstring. But anyways, this was the major update from the world of sports. You guys can surely read to us on our social media handle, which is at the weight of Indus News Sports, which works for Instagram and Twitter. Till then, take good care of yourself and bye-bye.